This is Glambition Radio, episode number 267 with Susan McPherson, author of The Lost Art of Connecting. Ladies and gentlemen. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Welcome to Glambition Radio. I am your host, Allie Brown. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor, investor, and founder of The Trust, the modern premier network for seven and eight figure women leaders. I love thinking big, doing different, and exploring ideas that disrupt the status quo, especially when it comes to women, because we are creating the new models for leadership, business success, making money, and changing the world. And hey, we're doing it with style. So let's go. I am coming off a huge high from being with my women of the trust last week here in Scottsdale. We had such an amazing meeting. And I tell you, given the last two years and everything going on in the world, there is something so special and treasured about meeting in person. Things happen that do not happen online. We love the online world. It's been a huge blessing for us. It's great to connect with people who can't travel or we can't see, but when we can, when we are together, I mean, we alter each other. We lift each other. Our frequency raises and we all left just on this incredible high. And in the app, which is our private community app for the trust, the members were making comments just like epic and I'm changed from this meeting and this was the best one ever. And that makes me happy because I, I hosted it (laughs) with this great place. I'm so fired up now for our meeting in March. We're going to be in Miami beach. We have special guest, Carolyn Aronson, who founded it's a 10 hair care. You know, that brand it's everywhere and she's still CEO as well. And she's going to be joining us in Miami. So Look, if you are a woman entrepreneur who's reached the seven or eight figure range, or you know one who is, and she's looking for something that's no BS, she doesn't need a coaching program. She just wants to be in this coveted space with these amazing women that I hold the space for, for everyone to connect, join the trust.org. We would love to consider you for the group. Now, connection is everything to my guest today. I'm very excited to have Susan McPherson with us. She's a new book out called The Lost Art of Connecting. Couldn't have come out at a better time. This ain't her first rodeo. She has 25 years of communications experience. She has so much great experience at all kinds of corporations. She's contributed to Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, Forbes. I mean, she knows her stuff. So this is going to be great. Two quick reviews, though, I want to read that my team pulled me from Apple Podcasts. Thank you to Meg Myers, 5678. She says, this is the only podcast I make time to listen to on a regular basis. As a busy mom and entrepreneur, I don't have time to waste. And hearing each woman's story reminds me that success in business is never a straight line for anyone. Thank you, Team Glambition. And thank you to Albanian Yogini. This podcast is ahead of its time, keeping you educated, connected, and informed. If you want to succeed in your field as a woman, you've come to the right place. I really appreciate the reviews. I know it is not first on your mind when you wake up in the morning saying, I'm going to leave Allie a review on Apple Podcasts. But can I tell you, It helps so much. It helps the algorithms. It helps more women discover this show and realize, oh my gosh, there's real conversations happening for women leaders. I don't need this boss babe stuff, right? We're over here. We're doing our thing. We want more women to discover the show. So that helps us. So karma is good. Pay it forward. Go leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate it. And don't forget, If you would like to get together with the amazing women, many of them who are in the trust with me, but we're going to be at a one-time event in November here in Phoenix. Everyone is welcome to apply. Iconicwithalliebrown.com. This is a two-day event. It's a bit workshop. It's a bit transformation. It's a bit this kind of uh, 
just amazing experience where we have these closed door conversations and you don't have to be at a million dollars to join us there. So if you've listened to things I'm saying about the trust and been like, oh, I'd love to be in that room. This is the closest thing you're going to get because so many of them are going to be there. And these women in the room already who have registered to join me at this event, average revenues in the room, around 2 million. I mean, it, it's going to be so powerful. So even if you've been in business just a few years, but you're at a certain level, we're looking for that. We're looking for, you know, this, you're not brand new to the space. Go have a look, iconicwithallybrown.com. You'll get all the details there and you can decide if it's something that you'd like to go for. I do feel, even though I think Mercury's in retrograde, feel this huge energy shift right now. This momentum is just picking up. I think October's going to move fast. There may be some crazy news going on just the energies seem to be really picking up. So, you know, be aware of what's going on, but remember, focus on what you have. Focus on what you can control. Focus on all the blessings in your life. And that's what we want you walking in the room with at Iconic, iconicwithallybrown.com, November 3rd and 4th here in Phoenix. Now enjoy this great conversation with Susan McPherson. Susan, where are you today? Well, hello, Allie. I'm actually in beautiful Portland, Maine. Oh, it's it's lovely up there. There's something different about Maine. It is. Even the sky is different. There just seems to be more of it than there is where I normally live, which is in uh, Brooklyn Heights, right across the East River from Manhattan. But that also could be because there's many tall buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Do you miss the New York energy or has this been good for you? Well, I've only been here for five days, so. <laughs> so it's like a you can't really tell <laughs> because of the pandemic. I have been in Brooklyn for about sixteen months, which compared to what I used to live or the way I used to live, I would be on the road probably one to two weeks every month. I mean, not all consecutively, but I traveled in twenty nineteen close to one hundred and twenty thousand miles. Wow! And so to go from that to zero is quite a a change. And so coming up to Maine is like a wonderful thing. I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. I do miss, you know, what I always, well, especially as, as a, uh, you know, I, I have twins, they're eight years old now, but that used to be my time, that time in the air in a sealed steel tube was like my only time <laughs> that no one could reach me. And I would do the best work up there too. Sometimes I would get so much done. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I, because it's a new place though, I have been spending a bit, you know, running around getting things like placements and, and trying not, you know, trying to be off email for a few days, but that, that is certainly challenging. So let's talk about when I saw this book coming out, I was, um, you know, first you see, you know, you see a lot of books on communication and connecting and networking, and then you seem to have a little something different to say. So, so tell me why you felt this book, it was important now. Well, interestingly enough, and when people see the title, they immediately assume I wrote it in response to the pandemic, but it was conceived and planned almost five years ago. It just sometimes can take that long from getting from an idea to the proposal to the, you know, contract to actually starting to write the actual book. So the idea for the book really came to me because I had started to see, and this includes myself, that the meaning and connection had begun to dissipate and maybe possibly due to technology, but we were able to obviously, quote unquote, connect any day, anytime with anyone, but we weren't being intentional about it. We weren't putting our heart into it and compassion and kindness. In fact, I saw it going the other way. And then a dear friend of mine said to me that when she took her 10-year-old and 12-year-old to the school bus stop in the morning and literally hug them goodbye and send them up on the, the, the steps to the bus or whatever bus staircase it is. And they would take their respective seats. And as soon as they sat down, their heads would literally bop down to look at their handheld devices. Mm -hmm. And every other child on the school bus did the same thing. And I thought to myself, whoa, this is not good. And quite frankly, Allie, I don't have remarkable, wonderful memories of my school bus rides. But I do recall talking to my classmates yeah. about what they did the night before or what was coming that day at school. So both of those kind of embedded in me that because my love and passion for connecting people was so deeply rooted, 
I felt really ready to put that down on paper and give people really practical tips on how to do it. So again, prior to the pandemic, although I did end up writing the book for seven months during 2020, and I'm often asked, how was that experience? And I will just quickly say, I was filled with gratitude because it gave me something to focus on. Yeah. And and the perfect book at the perfect time, it was, I, I assume that as well. When I saw it, I'm like, oh, this is perfect because someone is responding to this disconnection that we're experiencing and, and watching the kids has been heartbreaking. The devices, like you said, first of all, and now a lot of them are growing up, not, you know, being as close to others as usual and making eye contact and those skills that I know for my children, you know, communicating, connecting for me, that humanity is the most important thing I want them to experience. And it's a thing that you can't replace that with AI. This is the human gift. No. And I, I, you know, I grew up in a household where both my parents were serial connectors, but they used the telephone and the manual typewriter. And I, may I say rotary type telephone? We didn't have a push button telephone in those days. And they did it from the heart. They did it without any kind of hidden agenda of, oh, I'm doing this to get something back. It was to put a little love out into the world, to let people know that they were thinking of them and nothing else, truly. Mm. So, so go in, let's go into what is in the book. You know, what can we, but some things maybe we can learn today. Well, I'm going to let you drive for a bit. Sure, sure. Well, the book, because it's a business book, it is very prescriptive. You know, McGraw-Hill as a, as a business book publisher, uh, make sure to that for good and bad, right? But the book is divided into three sections that I can quickly go over that I think your listeners might appreciate. The first is the gather section. And the, the, the sequence is gather, ask, do. And in the gather section, the first and foremost important person you connect with is yourself. And really do kind of a self audit to determine what does a meaningful connection mean to you? Mm. What your hopes and dreams and goals for, say, the next four years, four months, hell, even four weeks? And who is it that you want to connect to or reconnect with that might help you meet those goals or reach those goals, as well as how can you be helpful to them? And what are your superpowers that you have, your secret sauces that you can go ahead and lead with to be helpful to others? Because a key underlying theme of the entire book is leading with how can I be of help? How can I be supportive to mm-hmm. others? Mm-hmm. Because I really believe and I've witnessed that when we lead with how we can be helpful, the world helps us. And I want to caveat one thing. This is not about not taking the oxygen mask first, because again, you know, by helping others, you are helping yourself, not in lieu of putting yourself last. That's not what I'm suggesting. Right. And then lastly, in the gather phase, Empowering yourself, and I go into detail on this, but how are you going to ensure that you get out of your hermetically sealed bubble so that you can meet people who don't look like you, sound like you, the same age, culture, and racial makeup as you? Because we all know a goldfish can't see its water if it doesn't break out of its bowl. Mm -hmm. That's the gather phase. The ask phase is learning to ask the meaningful questions of others so that you can learn what their hopes and dreams are. And if you listen carefully, which of course I learned we're woefully bad at, myself included, we can get to the do, which is where I think all of us really pride ourselves on. And that's where we can be trustworthy, reliable, responsible, and doing the things we say we're going to do. It doesn't have to be the next hour, the next week, but maybe over the course of a year. (laughs) But that essentially is the arc of gather, ask, do. And I would go so far as in this weird vortex we find ourselves in. You know, it feels a bit like Groundhog's Day with with COVID. But I think this is a real healthy exercise to do because we can, when in our lives have we had a reset opportunity Mm. to really flesh out what it is that we want and how are our connections going to help lead us there and vice versa? How are we going to help them? Yeah, because it's important to remember that usually I mean, when you're looking at even just a a goal, right, which I know this is about more than that, but if you have a goal, usually people are the way through that. People are the way to that. Every single good thing that has ever happened to me in life happened to me through a connection. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I, I remember hearing someone, someone once say that like, you know, things remember that, that things happen from source through people. And I love that from an energetic perspective. And yes. so this brings, uh, uh, I don't like the word formula. It feels too dry to me, but it's, it's very simple. And I'm going to say something, it's really interesting in, in my many years of doing this show now, even the people that I would say, I'm even a really starstruck to get on and I'm a little nervous to interview, even at the end, when I always ask something like, is there anyone that I've interviewed you'd like to be connected with? Or, you know, I'll usually try to just offer something like that. And, and they've always, almost always took me up on something. Like they were grateful for something. And you're thinking these people have all the connections they need. They don't need another friend. <laughs> they don't need another endorsement. They don't need another deal. And they're almost always like, oh, that's wonderful. Or could you give me a testimonial? Or, you know, I'd, I'd like an introduction to that guest that you had on your show. I said, no problem. We, we will connect you with her team. And, and so sometimes we forget that our help could be valuable. And I think as women, we, we love helping others, but sometimes we even question the value of our help. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'll just be honest with you. There's not a day that goes by that I don't have imposter syndrome. And I thought, well, maybe once I finally publish a book, I'll get over it. But no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are still helping people because then it doesn't matter, right? It just, you got to help them. Help them anyway. <laughs> yeah, we all have those moments. Now, now tell me about, you have a long and impressive career. T tell us a bit about how you became Susan McPherson. I'm intrigued. Well, there, there were two parents. Um, no, I won't that. <laughs> you know, I, I often say it's the detour, not the destination. And, you know, if you had asked me in my 20s that when I would be 56, I'd be living in Brooklyn, single, parentless, childless, but running a very successful company, I would have like laughed in your face because this was never part of the plan. But that I have found to be one of the joys in life, that we just don't know what we don't know. And mm. if we plan so specifically we're going to miss opportunities. And so I was always the one, you know, I wouldn't say the one, I mean, I've made many, many correct decisions or smart decisions, but I'm just like anyone else have made many bad decisions too. But I will say I have always been willing to take risks. And my late father once said to me, you know, nothing is a prison sentence, of course, unless it's a prison sentence. But in other words, you, if you build relationships with people, you can always go back. You know, you can return, you can go back to an old company that you worked for, or you can go to, you know, return to a city that you left, perhaps you moved away. But my, my career has spanned USA Today, PR Newswire, Concur Technologies, and a boutique consultancy, Fenton Communications, where I created their corporate responsibility practice. And then on a lark, I started my company as a placeholder. It'll be eight years ago this month basically until I found the next job. The previous consulting firm I was with had an exit of talent. And for any of your listeners who work in the consulting world, a consulting firm is only as good as the people that work there. Mm -hmm. So when people were exiting, for me, the writing was on the wall and I knew I needed to hurry up and find a job. And, you know, even at 48, I was starting to feel the effects of ageism, which is very much a thing. And eight years ago, it was too. And a couple of organizations, one named Girl Rising, which is a documentary film and movement, and another called Global Citizen Year, an incredible nonprofit, both said, Susan, if you leave, we'll hire you for about four months. So that gave me a runway. Mm -hmm. And I joke, Allie, I named the company McPherson Strategies because I didn't think it was going to be anything. It is my ex-husband's name. We broke up in 2003. Thankfully, he's a wonderful guy. But you know, if I had thought, I would have given a little more thought to it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But the company, and, and sorry for the band camp story, but the company is based on what I had been doing the 10 years prior, which is the communications of social impact, of social good, corporate social responsibility, NGO communications, philanthropic communications. So helping organizations basically message and tell their stories to the audiences they want to tell. I had a question on that. If I could yes, poke around that for a minute, because that's interesting. I have a very entrepreneurial perspective. I, I have worked for myself for 20 years now. All my clients are, are women who are in the seven and eight figures. They, they run their own businesses. When you go into the larger companies, how are they even approaching all this communication with, with their employees, with all the tech that they're using now? Like, how do you even, what are their, what are your philosophies that you go in there and try to share with them? Like, what is the conversation? Well, it has to happen before the tech. 
In other words, because tech can take a, on a life, life of its own if it's not proper, if, if, if the messaging that they are trying to get out there is, I don't want to say so prescriptive, but carefully created with all of their stakeholders in mind, right? Because companies, certainly large multinational corporations, Fortune 500 companies, have so many different interested parties, you know, the communities they operate in, their employees, their shareholders, their clients, their customers, everything, their partners, their distributors. So when they do, quote unquote, communications, they have to be mindful of all of those parties, which is part of the reason why it takes so long to get anything done from the standpoint of mm-hmm. impact change. But the good news is what used to be a nice to have for companies now is a must have. A company cannot get by without having an environmental, social and governance plan, which is called ESG. Mm. A company cannot get by without annually reporting on their sustainability the same way they have they've reported to Wall Street with their annual 10K. So the good news is, is this is now like normative, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's a little bit more challenging is in startups who, for whatever reason, believe they in the past that they need to be profitable before they pay attention to impact. Yeah. changing because, you know, we're seeing, you know, everything is connected with climate and, you know, Gen Z and certainly millennials want to work for companies that make purpose and, and corporate social innovation at the top of the food chain. Yeah. But we, if, if the company's already been communicating via all sorts of technology, the cat's out of the bag. I hate that statement. I can't believe mm-hmm. I just said that's out of the bag. Please rewind. <laughs> oh, this is just like what we grew up saying, right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Does it make it sound old? I'd say that. <laughs> is that something else we can't say now? I don't know. Is it? Oh, no, I know. It's like, okay. oh my gosh. Did we, just, did we, did we harm cat lovers? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I'm like, I'm like, does this mean something we didn't know? All this stuff drives me crazy. Okay. <laughs> We're fine. We're going to leave it in. The cat's out of the bag. It's okay. It's something like my grew up saying, whatever it is. Yeah. So... <laughs> That's what's interesting on the flip side of that with the the women I see starting even their, you know, kitchen table ventures now is it's immediately tied to impact. They have that already in their mind. So it's, it's really cool to see that everyone's tying it into something that they feel is, you know, really a shift that needs to happen in the world, whether it is social justice or, or climate or, you know, whatever is important to them. And it's, it's wonderful to see this all tied together in that way. For sure. And it's it it almost sometimes when we're feeling despondent about the state of the world, it does give me hope. Yeah. Because business has, you know, for good and bad, a lot of power. And if they channel it into the right causes, locations, areas, they can make a world of difference. Yeah. So if I in some small capacity can help them get there and then communicate that, then then I feel like my firm and we're doing a good job. I will say though, you know, it has to be much more than, than talk, right? It has mm-hmm. to be action. You know, it, it's one thing to make a bold statement. It's another to follow through on it. So how does the book, the, the lost art of connecting tie into your work you do with companies? Well, a couple of things. One for the last eight years. And of course, when I was writing the book, it was seven years of my company's history. 95% of our business has been inbound. So what that taught me was all the connections I made in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s that I stayed in touch with, came back to help. I mean, may not be existing clients, but knew someone who knew someone who knew someone. So that's a direct correlation. But a lot of the book is, you know, making meaningful connections is finding similar values in others, finding the commonalities in the uncommonalities. And we all have them. And oftentimes when we care about something, that will bind us together in some ways, right? I mean, you think of parents, they all universally have a love for their children, right? So the book has a lot of details on, you know, getting together, for instance, to fund a cause and and using making events to showcase a particular interest that needs expounding upon. So Mm -hmm. I would say an absolute direct connection to our business, but a big part, a big theme in the book is the fact that that we used to have our work selves and our home selves, but now, quite frankly, you know, we're we're one self. And I joke that it's hard enough being one person. Why would you want to be two people? So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, in terms of, of, you know, leading with vulnerability, leading with compassion, connecting with vulnerability, 
that is very much about what the work we do. Yeah. How how do you recommend people keep that social connection in a time of this, you know, hybrid hybrid models are what we're seeing a lot of right now. A lot of offices are saying, uh, you know what, we're not taking people back till later in the year and people are continually isolated. What, what What is your advice for those people? Well, in the research for the book, I found out that companies that literally make connection a high priority, that those companies literally reap far greater productivity their employees tend to stay at the company longer and recommend the company to others. So what I would recommend to leaders right now is to do everything in their power to make people feel like they belong, even if they're not physically at the headquarters. And we most likely will be in some sort of hybrid situation going forward where some people will be at home, some people will be at the office, some people will be in some kind of whatever in between co-working. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I say to C-suites and, and chief executive officers, this is the time to actually make it a priority and not just leave it to the annual sales conference or the monthly happy hour, but also be smart and not just say, oh, bring your full self to that Zoom meeting or bring your full self to your office because sometimes people don't feel safe and you have to help them feel safe. And the way you do that is you open up and be more open and vulnerable yourself, right? You can't expect Uh others to open up if you're not. But, you know, I recently heard I was in a conference call with probably 20 other consultant owners. And one of them, one of one of the big ad agencies had hired somebody to be the director of hybrid employees. In other Mm -hmm. words, actually spending, you know, their day job, making sure people were connected. And the good news is when I, when I heard that, I was going, you know, that's a good business decision. I love that. Yeah. Because these people, if they, they belong, they're going to be more productive. Yeah. Because it is just weird. They're like in this weird orbit that they, yeah, it's just a strange time. Like I can't imagine now, you know, when I did work, I loved being around people. Like I, I'm, I have a real problem. I I have these two sides to be like, I have like complete isolation. I want to live in a cave, but then like my little switch will turn on and be like, Oh, I need to be around energy and people. And it's, it's nice to have that option, you know? So I, I think for some people, maybe this is great, right? Because they get that time at home to do the buckle down work, but there's a way to be connected with others. And, But I'd love that they have a person assigned to that because it, that shows a few things that like the company cares, right? It's for the betterment of their employees. So the employees are going to be happier. But also, you know, that's something that we should look at because that means this, this model isn't going away. I know that there are yeah. people who... Um, don't care to go back to the office. They're quite happy you know, with this arrangement. And there's some that are dying to get back. I do, I do think the hybrid will, will be important. I, I actually have gone back to local employees and, and had right before this all hit. And now we've kind of found our rhythm. You know, we get together maybe once or twice a week. It's nice to see each other. No, we're real. I love sitting in a room with a whiteboard and a group of amazing minds like that. There's still to me nothing like that. But then we can go back and get our nose to the desk work done. You know, I, I, I think it's that the lesson in that is thinking forward, thinking, how do we make this better for our teams? How can we help them perform better in this new world? And how do we open up each meeting with an icebreaker that actually leads people to be more open with each other, as opposed to talking about the weather in Cleveland? Not that I have anything against (laughs) Cleveland. Uh, It's funny. I have a a cute story. Years ago, I lived in Denmark during my junior year of college, and I lived with a wonderful Danish family who I'm actually still in touch with all 30 some odd years later. And my Danish father used to say to me, you Americans, just to keep, you know, you hate silence, but you don't talk about anything meaningfully. You talk about the weather. This was 1985, Allie. And I have to tell you, every conference call I've been on since, and then, of course, this last year and a half with Zoom chats and Microsoft team meetings, inevitably, that is the lowest common denominator. The weather. I guess, Susan, it's the only safe space left, though, when you think about it. (laughs) Sometimes we're scared to ask anything these days. The weather is generally a safe place. People don't have like rabid opinions on the weather. I don't know, but help me out here. I need to rethink this maybe. Uh, Well, you know, you have a very good point there. I mean, you could talk about chocolate, I guess. (laughs) Well, you know, people, you know, there's very few people out ice cream, you know, apple pie, right? Baseball. I mean, but I'm being silly. But no, it's, you know, we, my company, since, what is eight years ago? I can't even remember. Since 2013, we've been virtual. 
So long before the pandemic, we had already kind of cracked the code on how to have meaningful conversations via conference call, via, via, you know, whatever app we were using online. So come March 2020, it was the one thing we didn't have mm. to redirect and, and redesign. But I do think it, you know, it, it really comes down to prioritizing and just giving that space, maybe five minutes at the beginning of every meeting to have some sort of deeper connection. You know, it could be a prompt as to, you know, after this pandemic's over, where in the world do you want to go? Or, hmm. you know, what was your favorite food growing up? Mm-hmm. Which gives you a, okay. somebody's, you know, childhood and, and, and gives you a window into the world that they came from, but isn't, isn't so invasive that, you know, you could make someone feel uncomfortable. Okay. Got it. That's, yeah, that's perfect. Everyone loves talking about food, travel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good. Good. Yeah. It's funny because I, I tend to skip. It's funny because with my friends, I'll have like really meaningful conversations with my clients. I will, but sometimes with my team, my mind's just, you know, when you're the boss, as you know, this, yes. your mind's always on the agenda. You know, you just, I, I have like 17,000 things we need to get through in an hour. And maybe I should ask, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do that in my next call. I'll let you know how that goes. Oh, I would love to hear that. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. That's a good reminder for me. Because I, I get to my business mode and that's all I am. <laughs> but again, I think I want to remind you and, and your listeners, there's actual business benefits here, right? I mean, we assume we get on the phone, we got work to do, we got to get it done. But over the long arc, if your employees, if your contractors are more closely connected, even friends, they're actually going to be happier. Of course, that is yeah. generalization, but the research proves it. And I think what I forgot is that when we were in person all the time, it would naturally happen, right? You're, you're grabbing a cup of coffee together, like, oh, how's John, you know, and is your grandma better? And, you know, those things just happen more naturally in person because you have the breaks and, and the taking a breath and, and talking about what's for lunch. And, and I think, you know, working that now into the new normal. Yes is very important. It's a bit more, you have to work it in. It doesn't happen as naturally or, or, but you're, you know, you're showing how it can, if you just make it part of the rhythm. Yeah. And I think you also need to be paying attention to people who may be a little more introverted and give them kind of a leg up as well as people who, who may be, you know, feeling shy or, you know, I certainly don't require my team to be on camera every moment of every day because it's ridiculous. We never used to be when we'd be on phone calls, right? So I try to let people be who they are, mm. you know, and, and feel comfortable on that same note. If, if, you know, you're at a large company, it's probably important to be as visible as you can on these conference calls. But the people that run the business need to understand that some people are just not going to feel as comfortable and probably have very good reason. So you need to be sensitive to that. Mm. So Susan, where can people learn all about the book, all about your work? You know, where should everyone follow you and, and pick up the book? What a lovely question, Allie. Thank you. Uh, the book can be found at any any online or physical bookstore that you favor. But the website for the book is thelostartofconnecting.com. And my company is McPherson Strategies, which is mcpstrategies.com. And then I'm on all the social webs at Susan McP1. And I'd love to hear from any of your listeners and, and be of support any way I can. Which, which social is your favorite? You know, I, I have, I, I, how do I say this? I, I use them for differing things. So Twitter, I very much use for professional reasons, but also to shine a light on others who are doing amazing things in the world. Hmm. Instagram is mainly for my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Although now with Insta Stories, you know, I use it to showcase all the, the, the friends that I love and adore and, and, and their good things. And LinkedIn is solely for work kind of thing. So I, I guess I would like them all. I have not explored TikTok. I'll be completely honest with you. And I don't, can, can we both agree not to do that? Can I, can we have a pact? <laughs> Also, because I just turned 50, I'm like, I don't think I need to be on TikTok. You're a baby. Well, TikTok and then Clubhouse, I dabbled in a bit. And I, I think the technology and, and the audio only is fascinating. But I, I just, you know, you know, when you are at that point where you're just at capacity and that just wouldn't fit. Something's got to give. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was I was distracted by it for a while, for a bit. I never got on a call. I was gonna like, you know what? This is a wait and see. Is this just because everyone locks down? They're all excited to talk. Like I don't know what this is, and I'm not swearing it off, but I'm still kind of waiting to see what where that goes. Do you see a lot of people still using Clubhouse? I yes, 
I mean, I see I see a lot of people experimenting with it. And then I do know some people who are diehard, right? Like they right. live there and they spend all day there. I would lose my mind, quite frankly. My dreams to be off the internet and everything. <laughs> like, I just... <laughs> I'm trying to bank so much that one day you're all going to see me just disappear. <laughs> you know, no dissing the other platforms, but if you're on Clubhouse, you really can't be doing anything else. You can't be multitasking. Right. You can dive into Twitter, look at a few, you know, feeds that are of interest to you and then leave. But Clubhouse, if you really want to like learn anything, you have to like listen for a long time. Yeah, it's a very dedicated space. But, you know, kudos for people trying new ways, you know, to connect. I mean, they've really, you know, the 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 founders really exploded during the pandemic because I think it gave people another way to connect. And I am all for any way people find connection. Totally. So Susan, last bits of advice for everyone. Can you share three great pieces of advice? I certainly will. One would be, and I mentioned a little bit of this earlier, Keep in mind, no matter where you are in your life, it's the detours, not the destination. Two, be eternally curious. There is nothing that can go wrong from being curious. And lastly, and something I fervently believe, and that is do your best to lead with kindness, compassion, and empathy. Because the world needs it. We all need it. Mm, I love that. Susan, thank you for joining us and we will be following you online and we'll pick up the book, The Lost Art of Connecting, The Gather, Ask, Do Method for Building Meaningful Business Relationships. Thank you. Thank you. What a joy it is and was to talk to you today. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Glambition Radio. If you enjoy the show, make sure you subscribe so you automatically get my new shows every week. Also, I'd love if you left us a review so more women like you can discover us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, and other major platforms. And I'd love to hear from you personally. Come join the conversation on social. Instagram is my happy place lately, and that's Allie Brown Official. But you can find links to my other platforms at AllieBrown.com. Glambition Radio is the elevated conversation for women leaders, and I'm honored you tuned in.